All right, so it's recording now. And just for Zoom edification, you can always tell that in the upper left of a screen. So you know whether somebody's recording you, even if they didn't tell you. <laughs> um, probably best first would be for us to go around the room so you know who we are, Joan, and kind of have a sense of why we're interested in everything from microbiomes to syntrophy to, to what may just be loose associations of organisms in nature. OK. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll start. I'm me, so Garden <laughs> Ecosystem Center, really interested in plant root microbe interactions. So I'm Elena Lopez Teredo. I'm interested in how plants uh, adapt to new environments and I'm interested in how the microbiota associated with those plants interact with them during those transitions. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Chris and Hunter Severa. Um, I'm interested in uh, marine uh, cyanobacteria and looking at some of its interactions with heterotrophic bacteria and its own population dynamics and how those affect each other. Are you able to hear this fine? Yeah, could you speak up a bit? <laughs> yeah, we, we might have to yell at the, not yell, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Kathy Regan from the Ecosystem Center and I'm interested in the so, composition of microbial communities under conditions of different carbon source as their food supplies. I'm Blair Paul. Um, I'm interested in protein variation, how it affects interactions between microbes and within the cell. Huh. I'm Anna Maglia. I'm a research assistant here and I do some cyanobacteria culturing. I'm Scott Classic. I am a postdoc here and I'm interested in microbial community assembly in uh, rhizosphere systems and how microbial communities contribute to biogeochemical cycles. Um, I'm Anthony McLean. I'm a research assistant here um, and I'm working in a lab that's looking at um, ecological interactions of bacteria in the human microbiome. I'm Emil Ruff. Uh, I'm interested in understanding diversity and disentangling the complexities um, by using uh, enrichment. Yeah, you're laughing. I'm laughing too. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible task. Um, <laughs> what an inspiring but, one. <laughs> by using enrichment um, cultures and, and other cultivations, and I'm specifically interested in um, syntrophic food webs, um, heterotrophic syntrophic food webs. Hi, I'm Suzanne Thomas. I am Zoe's technician. Um, I'm interested in plants, plant roots, uh, bacteria, and algae. Great. I'm Jessica Mark Welch. Uh, I am interested in the microbiome of the human mouth, the very complex communities that grow on the tongue and the teeth. We do imaging of these communities and we try to understand how the bacteria interact with each other and with the host. So I was very interested to look at your paper. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, uh, Fernando Rodriguez. I'm interested in transposons and how the host is able to um, manage transposon invasions by uh, epigenetic mechanisms, uh, mostly in metasoans. I work with rotifers mostly. And um, I'll try to talk quietly, but um, I'm Brooke Weigel. I'm a PhD student at the University of Chicago and I'm studying microbial communities associated with the photosynthetic blades of kelp in kelp forests and trying to understand how that affects nutrient cycling, especially carbon cycling. Uh -huh. Is that snow outside your window? Oh, it's actually just light. Uh, it is no, there's no snow on the ground in Chicago now. <laughs> All right, so you have a sense of the breadth of the community you're talking to here. <laughs> Yeah. the diversity of it. Um, <laughs> I wonder uh, what would be best, it occurred to me maybe not everybody may have been able to completely read the paper, I don't know for sure, so maybe we should just for a second get definitions down so that we're not talking past one another because it seems as though there's uh, con not confusion, there's disagreement as to even what a holobiont exactly is. So could I do that briefly with a, a PowerPoint that I'll share and then we'll get back to this mode and we can talk more broadly? Just kind of That'd set it perfect. Yeah, great. Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna share my PowerPoint, which you should be able to see both of you, yeah? Uh-huh. Okay, I'll move you around. <laughs> 
pinning on. There we go. Wow. Okay. So um, a lot of us have been involved with uh, the microbiome initiative or the ideas of microbiomes for a number of years now. And, and they are obviously described in really different ways, defined in different ways. We talk about a microbiome of mud, for example, and uh, my host is mud, is that sort of a famous quote from Vicki Orphan at the Microbiome Initiative. You know? So when we're talking about hosts, often we're just talking about the environment in which these things are. Um, in this paper and often within other literatures, the host is actually a, an organism, a, a multicellular organism. Yeah. Let's not get confused there. And in this case, I'm, I just cribbed exactly, these are quotes from the paper. Okay, the microbiome is an ecological community of commensal or symbiotic or pathogenic microorganisms. And I like that you laid out both ends of the spectrum, the positive and the negative interactions that share the body space of a host. And so we talked the other day a little bit about whether that means they have to be inside or can the body space be on the outside and really a gut is outside the organism anyway. And so what does this really mean? <laughs> so that's sort of an interesting potential conversation. Um, the holobiont is the composite organism, right? Consisting of the host with the microbiome in this paper. And the hologenome is the union of all the host genes with all the genes of its microbiome. So all the genes that are there in that unit in the proportions that they're actually existing. And so those proportions change yes. in the modeling that's in here. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, shall I, yeah, do but, you wanna do this? I can no, no, have you do, do this. I'd you're rather have you do this. <laughs> absolutely great. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Moving on <laughs> to the, beyond these definitions, um, the whole genotype is the configuration of the whole genome in the individual whole bio. So we're thinking about literally a host with some associated microbes in maybe various proportions. And then we're thinking about the frequency or how, the, uh, how um, often you're seeing a particular configuration of, of host microbiome uh, mm -hmm. organism, holobiont, in a population of holobionts, right? So there's two okay. kinds of levels there. There's both the organisms themselves and their frequencies, and then there's the characteristic of a particular type of holobiont versus another one versus another one in a population of holobionts. Sorry, that's probably not perfect. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so the hologenotype is just the configuration of the hologenome. The hologenome pool is the set of all hologenotypes in the population of holobionts. So it's the opportunity, the world of opportunity in the genes that are there. The, um, let's see, hologenotype pool, yep. Holophenotype is the hologenotype's expression in the behavior, physiology, and morphology of the holobiont, so how the whole thing works and behaves. And then selection, holobiont selection, is differential reproduction and or survival of holobionts that collective thing. So differential reproduction or survival of holobionts as a function of their holophenotypes. So this would have been super handy and maybe it ended up in our BII proposal, but I think something as, as uh, quantitative as this could have been, could really strengthen the way we're thinking about symbioses in multiple centers here at the MBL. <laughs> so, um, that that whole genome pool has both the whole giant holobiont population size and the frequency distribution of hologenotypes over the space of all possible. Okay, so so you get the sense of where we're what we're thinking about. We're thinking about the collective and we're thinking about the individuals both. Okay, so Those of you who read the paper found a beautiful introduction. Thank you very much, Joan, <laughs> uh, laying out the guts of the ways people are thinking philosophically about what holobionts are or what microbiomes contribute or how you even can think about whether there's selection for a holobiont on a holobiont or not. And so we often think about 
whole abiant selection really. I think we, we think about the, the, um, the unit of selection as being the host plus the microbiome often in a positive sense. So um, thinking about that, that there is uh, the possibility for selective forces to drive the more favorable reproduction of one configuration of a holobiont versus another, right? So part of that is supported by this incredible intricate and intimate integration between hosts and microbiome that we've been interested in. And that also applies, I think, to syntrophy, really, if there's a bunch of signaling and a bunch of interdependence. And that that integration itself is evidence potentially of the power of the whole biome selection to produce co-adaptation. But the skeptics argue that classic co-evolutionary selection operating on the individual units, sometimes called particles, as you saw, <laughs> can produce potentially that same integration. And so how do you tease that apart? And they would argue that Microbiomes also are not necessarily helpful, and we know that from a lot of gut microbiome literature. And they're quite focused on vertical transmission of the microbiome, and that that vertical transmission is quite rare. Now we can argue about that, but the point of the modeling here is to get at that idea, that core idea that many people share, that you have to have vertical transmission of the microbiome in order for it to be possible for there to be this selection on the holobiont. So what I love about this paper is that it just distilled that core question all the way down to this really simple model. And, sh and it's intentionally simplistic. And that is trying to test whether holobiont selection could occur either with vertical transmission so every host holobiont, every host with its microbiome, that holobiont produces next generation, not exactly a copy of itself, but you know what I mean, a combination of that same morphology, same thing, same combo, versus there being a step in between where you can have a shifting contribution of other microbiome members moving into and making a new holobiont that's more <coughs> okay so it tests whether vertical and horizontal transmission both either one of them could be involved to support actual holobiont selection so evolution of on the holobiont we're good all right Perfect. Right, Thank now, you. We're, now we're done with the PowerPoint. So I'm going to get out of here, but I can also show the paper if you want. <laughs> Let me move this. Stop the share. All righty. Huh. Would you like to clarify anything I tripped over? <laughs> no, you didn't trip over anything. Oh, that's fabulous. You do a better <laughs> job than I do. <laughs> no, I don't know about that, but. <laughs> But again, what I love about this is that you go to the core of that question very, very uh, pointedly. And you said in your email that you're actually taking a next couple of steps right now. Do you, do you mind saying where it's kind of going and then we can discuss the paper? Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the main objections, of course, of the paper that, that I did so far is that there was no genetic variation in the host. Uh, and there were there was only one stream uh, one strain of, of microbe, so there was so to speak no genetic variation among the microbes either and uh, I felt that this question of whether the uh, presence of horizontal transmission was fatal to the idea of holobiont evolution had to be addressed first with the simplest model for that, and there the the difference in Hologenotypes from one holobiont to another is simply in the number of um, uh, microbes in it. And as you'll recall from the paper, when when you think when you think about holobionts, the microbes you you can look at them in either of two ways. Uh, 
like an Escher print, I think I said, uh, you can look at them as actual little organisms, um, microbes, and microbes have a community structure and a population dynamics and all of that. But on the other hand, you can look at them as just encapsulated genes. They're just nothing but genes. And so they simply um, augment uh, the genes in the nucleus, and then you have some extra genes kicking around in the cytoplasm, and they happen to be the genes contained in uh, uh, the microbes. So uh, the hologenotypes in the model in the paper that you've looked at only differ in the number of uh, uh, microbes in each holobiont, which I'm calling the gene copy number. So it's basically selection on gene copy number where those genes are, are in microbes. And um, the main objection that people had, of course, to the paper so far is it didn't have genetic, actual genetic variation, multiple strains of microbes and multiple alleles in the host. And so that's what I'm in the thick of right now. I'm about uh, two thirds working through the model for that. And I can show you some of the diagrams from that if you'd like to see that later so that you can see that the, the project doesn't stop with this paper. This paper was simply the first step, but it was a big first step because it involved coming up with the conceptualization of a hologenotype and the conceptualization of a pool of hologenotypes and the idea that we could actually make a model for the evolution of holobionts that was logically parallel to the ordinary theory of natural selection in which you have selection on genotypes in a gene pool. So now we're getting holobiont selection on a holo hologene pool of hologenotypes. And, um, and so, for example, one of the, f the first results from the new model, from the extended model, is that uh, the coexistence of two microbial strains within the host is the logical counterpart of a polymorphism for nuclear genes. You're basically getting a polymorphism of microbial genes, uh, of, um, of microbes, looked at as components of the hologenome. And so, so if, you were, if you were interested in a particular functional gene, you could think of two different microbial types with that functional gene, but slightly different control of it, say, as being alleles? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So two different microbes with different uh, photo, um, oxidative capacities or tr sulfur transforming capacities would be basically like two different alleles. But in the part of the hologenome that's um, uh, pr pr present in microbes as opposed to the part of the hologenome that's present in the nucleus. I, I have a question to that Escher uh, concept of microbes. Yes. So the, the body, like just assume a human or, or any other uh, organism, if you say the microbes that this holobiont contains are like genes or alleles, there is a barrier though, because the, the organism, so the, the host organism cannot directly access these genes. It's not like we can um, uh, enhance transcription or expression like we can do with our own genes. So there is a barrier between still two organisms. So first question is how does the host or the holobiont overcome this barrier if really the microbes are like genes in the gene pool, then they need to sort of be directly ac accessible. Yeah. And the second, well, we can, I can ask the second, but the second question is, how does that barrier affect evolution then? So, because if we look at evolution of, an, of a, well, in quote, normal animal, there's, for example, uh, perception, like a sexual attraction in birds, in some kind of, some kind of per perception, some kind of um, direct uh, outcome in the behavior. So, if there's an evolution of the holobiont, how does how does the host connect to the to to to, to the microbes as genes in in that sense? <laughs> Well, let me take the first question. Uh, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, I, I, th I don't think it's known whether or not the host can control the transcription of the genes contained within the microbes 
within it. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that I should grant the premise to your question that, that the genes that are within the, the cell wall even of a microbe uh, are more remote from it than are the alleles within its nucleus, where, where of course, uh, modifier genes can control its uh, transcription. And, and uh, so I, I think that's an open question. Uh, and it's, a, it's interesting, it's, it's interesting too, because you might say, well, the microbe may want to have a voice, so to speak, in whether its genes are expressed within the whole of biont, which I think is what you're driving at. But then also uh, a chromosome uh, might have uh, a say, so to speak, in whether the genes on it are expressed. Um, and so there's, of course, the interaction of genes on the chromosome, on a chromosome with one another. So I, I think that's uh, uh, a, a, an open area for discussion. And, and I, I don't have a, a, an opinion on that because I think that's an empirical uh, matter. Well, now, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say, though, Neil, that we have quite a bit of evidence that products from particular microbes that look like hormones, for example, do control what plants do. And conversely, plants can secrete info chemicals mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call them that do affect. But so do we, that. do we lack this understanding in most organisms because we haven't found those substances? Probably. <laughs> but I don't know. That would yeah, be my, that's my bias. Yeah. There's a lot. Fungi has a lot of secret on uh, that they spell in the media. I guess that most of the aquatic uh, invertebrates they have some, um, it's not all the impulse, but there are some products that can mm -hmm. modulate environment. And in plants, there are so many bacteria that they just mimic the same hormones that the plant triggers. So the bacteria will produce them, the plant absorbs them, and then you have a tumor and you regenerate another plant. You can do that with bacteria. Those are trans transcription factors indeed. But I think the question is whether bacteria, any bacterium or consortium of bacteria, have like regulatory programmable control over yeah. over a genome or vice versa. And there's a difference between deploying toxins that can tweak certain a small suite of genes and having more or less comprehensive control of, of your genomes in both directions. And doesn't that beg the question how much control is required? Uh, comprehensive yeah. all the way down to whatever, then, well, then it becomes your maybe point. it's random. Maybe it's pretty random, uh, you know, what's going on in our gut. As long as it's not like disturbing, it could be, it could be fairly random what's actually happening um, because so many things happen at the same time. Random neutral, you mean, kind of? Yeah, like, yeah. you know, there's constant, ex there's constant exchange of, of metabolites and of signals and of things. And, and even if they're non-directed, they, they have an outcome. So they, not everything needs to be like, like a visual perception, for example, where we see something, then we understand it, then we can react to it. Um, but then aren't we, just, aren't we questioning of all of these sort of, I mean, it starts as kind of a molecular arms race. And then the question is how much of that becomes heritable and beneficial to both organisms or the multitude of organisms and how much evolution can actually control that over time, right? That question. It's not so much like what stochastically can happen in one instance between interacting organisms, but what is uh, maintained over time for the benefit of at least the majority. Yeah, the fitness is yeah. what you mean. Yeah. yeah. The randomness is where my mind went to as well. But I was wondering, you know, to some extent, maybe you can think of like a neutral model where, say, maybe there isn't selection going on in this particular host at this particular time or for this particular bacterium, but maybe that's analogous to like genetic drift in a way where, you know, maybe there's not selection going on in a human host or whatever. It's just that the difference, I guess, is that there is for sure vertical transmission of the host genotype. Um, whereas the, um, I guess, that's less, that's less, I mean, that's what, that's what the modeling gets at. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. 
Thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I don't really have much to add to that. That's a dialogue. <laughs> Can I ask about a feature of the model, which is in the, the reproduction stage that all of the, yeah, I'm thinking about the horizontal transmission reproduction. The microbes are basically all expelled into a single pool and mm -hmm. then divided amongst, divided more, divided more or less, divided amongst the host um, zygotes or whatever they were, uh, based on the relative proportions of hosts and the, uh, what I'm getting at is the number of microbes that each new host gets depended very directly on the number of microbes that were expelled into the environment, which is why the parasites tended to decrease in number and mutualists tended to increase. Um, it's because, so, so I'm, I'm trying to think about that in the context of, for example, human microbiomes, where the microbes reproduce so very much faster than the host that I think the model is, the, the, the actual situation is more like you pick up 100 from the environment and you turn them into 10 million. You know? <laughs> so I wonder whether that basic feature, this, that was a basic feature of the model that seemed kind of off relative to real biology. Now I couldn't decide, I, I'm guessing that there are ways you know, that the, the model is obviously a very simplified version and that when perhaps you incorporate genetic variation, it will get more sensible because it seems to me that the key feature of the gene pool, as far as the next generation is concerned, is the, the characteristics of the microbiota and not their abundance. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, I, I think what's gonna matter is the, the sort of the genotypes of the microbes that you pick up and not whether you get a thousand of them or 10 of them. Right, there are separate issues though. Uh, uh, one is the, the, um, the relative time scale of the microbe and uh, the host. And in the, the paper I'm working on now, uh, make that much more explicit in the, it, it is, I mean, part of the way the model unfolded has to do with the history of my discussions with uh, uh, Elena Zilba Rosenberg and uh, Jean Rosenberg, who, as you know, are microbiologists, and, and also with Scott Gilbert. And, and you may recall or be aware that they had a, a lot of focus on vertical transmission, which is why I started the modeling with vertical transmission. And then uh, from my own experience in marine work, uh, and, and I'm, my focal organism in all of this is a coral, and, and they're zooxanthellae. And uh, so it was really obvious that there's almost zero vertical transmission of zooxanthellae. And so that's why I felt compelled to look into the horizontal transmission issue, which has now come to the forefront. Uh, and so my subsequent modeling doesn't use the vertical transmission at all, but, but this paper does implement a contrast between the two. And the reason for doing that was because of all the early discussion focused on the need to argue that vertical transmission was sort of, was still going on, even if it wasn't via the gamete, but it was through the uh, intimate adjacent environment. And, uh, and as you know, I think that's actually a weak argument. Uh, but in any case, it's an unnecessary argument, uh, which is the key point. Now, um, the question of the generation time, um, uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the, the microbes changing dynamically within the host, which is why I allowed for that uh, proliferation stage to be an explicit dynamical model and I was using a logistic equation and so the logistic equation would actually go through two or three or four time steps micro time steps to, to equal one macro time step um, and so I was allowing for this explicit uh, within host dynamic followed by the between host selection in the framing I had uh, and that 
reflected, you know, the interest of the microbiologists in the community dynamics of the microbial community. Um, but that, that, that's what then led to the whole genotypic variation only in microbe number. Uh, uh, and, that, and that's the genesis of uh, why that was the initial kind of variation I was looking at. And, and that was sufficient to, to show that horizontal transmission didn't uh, um, invalidate holobiont selection and in fact works very well with it. Now the modeling I'm doing now uh, makes does make two further assumptions, uh, which uh, and the first of which is that the, uh, the the macro time step is assumed to be very long compared to the micro time step, so that the microorganisms come to equilibrium uh, within the macro time step, and so if two different uh, juvenile hosts are colonized by uh, different numbers of uh, a microbe, they nonetheless wind up with the same microbe abundance because that's the current capacity for it. So that that actually simplifies the modeling a great deal because I don't have to deal with this uh, within host dynamic explicitly. And the second assumption uh, also pertains to something else you were mentioning about what you're colonized with. Now, um, the colonization episode is, uh, uh, in my opinion, analogous to uh, random union of gametes uh, for, the, for the nuclear genes. So if you're interested in constructing the, the, holo geno the hologenotype after one generation, so after the gametes have been released into the gamete pool, and the microbes have been released into the microbe pool, then you get random union of gametes to assemble the nuclear component of the next generations. Uh, that's the mating system. So you get random union of gametes to, to, to construct the, nu the, the nuclear genotype of the next generation. And then you're getting this colonization dynamic from the microbial pool, which will then give you the microbial portion of the hologenotype dynamic. So, and, and then there are a lot of ways, just like you can have a lot of kind of mating systems, you could also have a lot of kind of colonization systems. Um, uh, and both would have to occur simultaneously to, uh, to, to produce the next generation's hologenotypes. So I made the assumption that the simplest possible uh, colonization process would be to assume now let's let's say the two two microbes two species two strains of microbes is to assume that the microbial pool is dilute so that you're not so that a host is not the juvenile host is not being colonized by a lot of it could be but i'm assuming that they're not being colonized by a lot of microbes just a couple of them and and so if you do that you can you, you can assume <laughs> that, uh, well, they could uh, be colonized by two individuals of one microbe, one individual of one strain, one individual of another strain, and two individuals of the other strain, giving you uh, binomial or Hardy-Weinberg ratios of uh, uh, microbes as well. And so, but you, you could make other assumptions for more complicated uh, uh, colonization systems. But I don't think the idea of a dilute uh, uh, microbial pool it, is that bad an assumption physically because uh, uh, the, the zoosanthellae around the water, in the water around a coral are, are really pretty dilute and it's not that easy to, uh, to get as a free living zoosanthellae from the water column. Um, and I forget the genus of them, but there's another genus that's responsible for most of the zoosanthellae. And um, so the, but with those two assumptions, I'm able now to do all the work mathematically rather than with a computer. So the paper that you have involves a computer iteration of the life cycle, whereas now I'm actually deriving equations for the polymorphism and for the stability of the polymorphism and for, for quantities that could be maximized analogous to the, 
adaptive topography in, in population genetics. So, um, so it's just so much to think about when you get into this, you know, and the, and the parallels. It's, it's one, this is one of the most fascinating questions I've ever worked on in my life. And, and I really am indebted to, to Ilana Zilber Rosenberg for, and Jean for, for introducing me to this problem and asking me to work on it. And as I was at a conference in Israel, I was telling this to Zoe yesterday. I was in, in a conference in Israel and giving a paper on animal social behavior, which is what I have been working on. And, and, uh, and Jean Rosenberg comes up to me and says, what do you have against bacteria? <laughs> and I said, well, nothing. <laughs> he was accusing me of being too vertebrate centric because I'm making, making this model, you know, of like birds interacting and so forth. And, and uh, and then I got really enchanted with this idea of a whole genome and the idea of an extensible genetic, uh, an extensible genome. And, and Jean and Elena said, well, we really need some, some modeling on this uh, because we're not getting anywhere. Um, and uh, uh, we're dealing with objections and people aren't uh, buying into it because I just don't see how it's going to work. And, and Scott Gilbert was there and... Uh, and he's a wonderful person, and uh, and he was very keen on this. And and I'm for, I was from a department when I was at Stanford where there was there's always tension and hostility between the molecular folks and the ecology evolution folks. And I saw this as an outreach by basically molecular people to someone who is an evolutionist to uh, to do something uh, in a, in a, at least intellectual collaboration. And, uh, and I thought that outreach definitely needed to be responded to and, and thought that was just a wonderful opportunity. So, but the upshot of it over the, you know, as I've been mulling this over over the last few years is that it's just, just a fascinating question. Uh, and, and it really makes you scratch your head all the time. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. A real long, a real long answer to your question. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was great, and and I think I, I definitely agree that the dilute pool of colonizers makes a lot of sense, and I think that's that's probably how it. I can't think of any situation where it wouldn't be a dilute pool of colonizers, so that that's great. Can I ask one other completely yeah. different question, which is that okay, so so at the end you come down to okay, so there could be host control of the microbiome, there could be co-evolutionary selection, or there could be holobiont selection. So as an experimentalist, I ask, okay, how can I distinguish between those? Like if I wanted to prove holobiont selection versus co-evolutionary selection, what am yeah. I looking for? Uh, well, I, th I think uh, a major issue, and unfortunately I didn't realize this at the time that I wrote the paper you have, and uh, it, because, in the modeling, uh, I've assumed, but didn't make it explicit, uh, ver ver you know, verbally explicit, but I did assume that there was a coincidence of interest, a co uh, an alignment of interest between the microbe and the host, which is sort of implicit in the idea of at least an endosymbiosis, where, uh, where the, the uh, symbiont lives inside the host. And so their fates are coupled. And uh, so I certainly assumed that in the model, but didn't say that that was a key, didn't point out how key that assumption was. And I've subsequently sent some papers to Zoe and have, uh, have interacted uh, by email with some folks from the, from the philosophy side who are very interested in this notion of the alignment of the interaction. They feel that, that the holobiont concept rests on that. And I think there's some merit in that point. And, and the key person on this is Paul Griffiths from uh, University of Sydney. And, uh, and the, from that, I then found that there was a literature in the, uh, the rhizobium legume literature in which someone had actually published a paper claiming that there was a coincidence, I mean, an, an alignment of interest between rhizobia and the legume host. And then, of course, that engendered a, a, a counter response saying, oh, no, they're in an arms race with one another. And uh, so we, so they're really enemies trying to cheat on each other, but they police each other. And so therefore don't wind up cheating because they police each other so well. And uh, 
you get into that whole kind of narrative of uh, um, uh, f fighting, fighting against each other. And the co-evolutionary theory always winds up being a, uh, a narrative of um, conflict, uh, which has to be regulated or moderated in some way. Um, so I, th I would say that the key thing to look at experimentally, there, therefore, is whether you can show that the microbe and the host have aligned interests. And if they're co-evolutionary, they don't have aligned interests. They're just playing ball with one another to see what each can get out of the other. And they, uh, um, you know, come, they equilibrate at a, uh, at a, at a standoff. Uh, and, and, and that's usually modeled in a game in, as a competitive game with a uh, Nash competitive equilibrium as the solution. And you get a very different, different kind of mathematical solution from these uh, um, holobiont models because you don't have the, the, the micro working against the host because their interests are aligned. And uh, so if you could show experimentally, I mean, test experimentally for whether they're aligned or not, that'd be a key thing. And I heard a paper and I got tipped off to this in the first place, uh, even before I, I read the paper by Paul Griffiths, uh, I was at a conference in November in um, Canberra, Australia, and it was about microbiomes. And you know, I'm, I'm not super familiar with all this, with all the players in this arena. So it was very interesting hearing different uh, folks uh, 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 interested in microbiomes and. Uh, and one one guy there from CSIRO, uh, and I believe he was working on legumes and rhizobia, alluded to the fact that his data showed uh, an alignment of interest. But so I, I chased up this paper, which was published in Evolution, and I could not find any reference in that paper to an alignment of interest. Um, but from that paper, I then found other papers which were explicit about it. So if you went to that experimental literature, uh, then that might be, uh, might also show techniques or setups or so on that you could do. So, so I think that's the key. If there's an alignment of interest, then it, that seems to me to be pretty diagnostic of a holobion approach if there's, a, a non-alignment or an antagonism of interest, uh, then that would point to co-evolution. And trying to quantify that is is a struggle. I, I was thinking about exactly that kind of question too, yeah. Jessica, and I was thinking about your your graphs in figure four and five and you know at the top where we're looking at the explosion of numbers of holobionts and the increase in the number of microbes. Yeah. and the holobiont fitness changes with microbe number, whether it's positive or negative. And I, I was thinking about the dynamics at the beginning of the experiments where if it's a, a, a pathogen, you have an increase in holobiont number, but you have at first a decrease in microbe number, but then yeah. because they're being carried along, yes, their, their numbers also increase. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about as the alignment of interest? Yeah. 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 And would there be potentially something in the dynamics as opposed to the final? I'm trying to think about how you, how you would even get at that. Right. right. I mean, I think because in a lot of cases, you have what's effectively an obligate symbiosis, right? The bacteria yeah. in the human mouth live only in the human mouth, yeah. and all humans have these bacteria. So in that sense their interests in some sense their interests must be aligned because must be aligned that's right, right. <laughs> you know? and, and yet you have cases where there's a microbe that's you know a symbiont or at least is just to hang around your mouth is not bothering you until you get some state of periodontal disease and all of a sudden it starts acting in a in a pathogenic sort of a way so hmm, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do there uh yeah yeah. Okay, how, how are you? How, is, how are you going to quantify in any way anybody's interests? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. The interests may stop being aligned. I mean, the perfect, I mean, the coevolutionary theory archetypally is for things like the uh, plant pollinator and the, the uh, cleaning fish, uh, um, then the cleaning fish on uh, rasses, the, the rasses and on sharks and things. And, uh, um, and then, you know, the sea anemones and the damselfish, but the, uh, but then you get to something like the the way the barnacles on whales, uh, the the so the commensals the, uh, and uh, so is that is that a, are, are they whole alliance you know and so there it's harder to say, but okay. they probably are. Uh, I mean, why would a barnacle uh, evolve as it were to be relatively passive. The barnacle could mine <laughs> the tissue of the uh, whale that it's living on, and uh, and turn itself into uh, in, into a kind of predator, or like a leech, you know. And uh, um, so I th I think the uh, the alignment of interest is is critical, and and I think it involves physical proximity. There has to be a physical attachment underlying the alignment of interests, a f f physical, um, as you say, proximity. And Zoe was mentioning that that you were you were saying that your the the my, microbiome around your plants or something uh, had to be right next to it because of the diffusion of sulfur, if I understood it correctly. Or oxygen, okay. yeah, but yeah. yeah. And uh, so that that kind of physical association. So, so you were asking earlier, you know, whether the microbiome has to be inside the host or whether it could be outside the host. <laughs> that I think was one of your initial questions. And, and so I think it could be outside the host, but it still has to be next to the host. <laughs> it has to be right there. And, uh, and, and I don't know how close right there is, but, but uh, real close. <laughs> so in influenceable chemically, perhaps, yeah. if not physically by yeah. the whole, which is how we define the rhizosphere. Yeah. I yeah. have a, a burning question about the, um, the horizontal transmission model. Yeah. Um, bringing it back to the, the paper. Um, so if I'm trying to understand it correctly, there's a bunch of microbes associated with the host and they all have the same probability M of leaving the host. And then they're in this transfer pool and then it says that the transfer pool is then distributed back equally um, across the holobionts population. Yeah. That's in the, um, in the vertical model, yeah. That is in the vertical model? Yeah, oh. only in the vertical model, yeah. Uh, uh, oh. In the horizontal model, all the, uh, the microbes go into a microbial pool. So, and then are, there's a sampling process to get them out of the microbial pool into uh -huh. the juvenile hosts. Whereas in the um, vertical model, there was just this trickle of horizontal transfer uh, necessary to prevent them, uh, n basically necessary to prevent each holobiont from being a, uh, a clone. Right, I guess. If M is zero, you're just getting clonal selection. My question, like I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, sort of the idea of taking all of the microbes from a host and expelling them into a common pool right. that is then recolonizing hosts um, versus like, uh, you know, hosts that acquire some microbes from the environment that might or might not be free living at other points in time and don't necessarily need to reside only in the host. Um, do yeah. you think that like, if there's some sort of larger environmental source pool involved and the host is allowed to have selection, differential selection from the larger pool, would this still apply? It seems a bit restrictive to have like just the host associated microbes expel and then recolonize and expel and recolonize. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is restrictive. So I am assuming that the uh, zoosanthellae, for example, uh, can't have uh, an independent life uh, in the water column. Uh, they're just uh -huh. there for a little while uh, waiting to hook up with a host, with uh, a juvenile coral. Now, uh -huh. if 
if uh, you have a basically a biphasic uh, uh, mi microbe where it can can live either in a so it can live either in a host or it can live by itself, then you'd have to divide the micro pool into the into those two sections, mm -hmm. and, uh, which would then you know be an extension of the model to take that into account. Now, the uh, the, the possible interest in doing that, other than just adding some complexity or adding adding some some realism, um, would be that that would uh, interfere with the alignment of interests, because if the microbes can live uh, their sweet old jolly life by themselves without the host, then uh, it sets up a uh, possible disalignment of it, or non-alignment of interests, so that they have their own um, as I say, life outside the host, as well as the life inside the host. So, so they're faced with a decision at all times of whether, which way to go. Now, mm -hmm. probably though, the, uh, that might, uh, I've been worrying about that because that could also be a rare case. I mean, it would seem a priori like, okay, well, that would probably happen a lot. But really, um, from, a, from a microbes point of view, uh, you should specialize on the habitat where you do the best. And if you do the best living alone, then there's no reason going colonizing the host. If you do better living the host, you should just colonize the host and give up uh, uh, living by yourself on, uh, unless you're stuck, on, unless, you, uh, unless you couldn't find a host. But uh, so, so there probably would be selection for specialization on being uh, obligate versus free living and that you I would predict that you wouldn't find based on that that thinking I'd predict that you wouldn't find many who really were equally distributed uh, in free living phases and and uh, host living phases um, mm -hmm. but that 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 would need looking into and, and and my model definitely doesn't have that feature to it the system yeah. I study is particularly interesting because they're an annual um, kelp species that reaches yeah. like, you know, heights of 100 feet in the water column and what's has the, this... What's the name of the kelp? It's the bull kelp, Nereocystis leucayana. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have this rich biofilm during the summer, but then um, all of that biomass is virtually absent from the system in the winter. So the, the microbes have to sort of be recruited from the seawater or this microbiome has to assemble in some way that seems more connected to the environment than to sort of a permanent host reservoir. But well, you don't know, I suppose you don't know that because you have the spores, right? Uh, these reproduce as diploid spores? Uh, yeah, and there's an overwintering microscopic stage, um, but the spores are very small, so I'm not sure how, yeah. But that's presumably I think it's where an open question still. But yeah, you know, once they start growing, that's that's presumably what the uh, um, my, my microbes from the water column then start to colonize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this idea of uh, vertical versus horizontal transmission and is really reminding me of an analogy to microbial genomes and how they evolve and how they're not necessarily um, easily defined by Darwinian evolution. So we can think of genes in the microbial genome as core or flexible, right? And we actually, thinking of Jessica's point of microbes that can kind of switch between mutualists and parasites, genes do that as well in microbial genomes for sure. And this just reminds me of, you know, a gene that maybe uh, resides in the microbial genome, but then is, is in nature selfish or parasitic. And microbes can actually control that to a sense by throwing those genes on plasmids or on viruses. And then later generations may acquire that gene and then that gene may become beneficial again. Um, but this kind of all reminds me of what we're talking about with now thinking of microbes as the genes, so to speak. Yeah. In, in huh. the That's interesting. And it's really a question of just what proportion of the organism, be it a microbe or be it a, a hollow ion, is core versus flexible. 
How do we test this though? Can't we come up with a clever experiment? We should. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yes, I mean, there's model organisms that grow fast, so you can look at yeah. multiple or lots of generations. Yeah. Um, well, Dros Drosophila has a, uh, of course, a, a microbiome in their stomachs, and uh, and I, I do think Drosophila would be a good system for this. Uh, Sets it aside. I don't know of anyone using that system, but uh, it's. It, I, I know that there's some characterization of the uh, microbiome in the uh, Drosophila stomachs or guts. I think at MBL, Drosophila was used a hundred years ago. The last yeah, time. we're <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> kind of not there. <laughs> <laughs> but we can we can find something else. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, actually, I mean protozoa. Have, I mean, I've had people uh, get in touch with me about protozoa and their uh, back, the bacteria in in living inside protozoa, and they could be considered its microbiome. And you could definitely uh, mm. marine, of course, uh, protozoa. Yeah. So I have another question, is how do you envision this working in organisms that have different life stages? For example, you have bryophytes, mosses that have haplodiploid cycles when they grow. You have uh, many marine organisms that will have different larval stages that might require different microbiomes during the life stages. Even the coral has different... That's right. Uh, how how will that work? Right, so that's like like Brooke's question too, actually. So we talked about this thing that has an annual cycle and then it dies. Okay, where did it? Yeah, but that, that grows. But yeah. then you have, for example, different kinds of larvae in, yeah. in, in um, whatever a copepod, pot, and some float, some don't, some. They're in the there. Gulf so Stream. Oh, oh, I see. Different different morphs. <laughs> yeah. Different yeah. morphs, yeah. different stages. Yeah. Because would you consider in your model every stage like a different all genomes in a way? Or because the host is the same, but the requirements and the genes that is used there probably are involved are different. Or I yeah, know. I guess uh, what what I would do there is, uh, and that would complexify the model a fair amount, but would be to yeah. introduce basically a demography, a demographic component, or an age, an age dependent component. So the host goes through. Uh, so, so in that in that stage of the model, uh, off to the left hand side of the diagram, where there's the uh, proliferation stage will break up that proliferation stage into several stages and um, corresponding to different demographic classes. So you'd have, um, I don't know, actually, for, for, you know, for, for barnacles, there's several stages of uh, nauplii and then there's the cyprid. And so you'd have each, I don't know what the stages are called in corals, but, um, all, all I know is the planula. So, so presumably there are these stages, and then you could have them as uh, 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 stages on the left-hand side. So you go from one stage to the next stage to the next stage demo, uh, as a demographic transition, like you go from age class to age class. And within each stage, you could then get um, the release of the um, the microbes from that stage, and then opening up for colonization from for microbes for the next stage. And so it would become a sequential uh, kind of model. Um, you probably have to do that on, on the computer though. So you could, you'd probably have to uh, implement that as a, as a simulation program. But uh, I, I don't know of the conceptual issue that that would address though. I think that would make it more useful for testing in a particular system. Um, un unlike the question that we were just discussing where the larvae, I mean the uh, microbes could live by themselves or in a host, uh, and that gets to the question of alignment and, and the question then of uh, um, specialization and, um, and, and 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 the transition, if you will, from a coevolutionary dynamic to a holobiont dynamic. Uh, uh, but but the the case you mentioned, 
I think would be very interesting if, for 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 a system where you were trying to test it where that was happening. So we've already amazingly hit an hour, which is our time frame. So um, I, I thought I'd just end by what I think is one of the most important things about the paper, which is that it's it's emphasizing the value of an alternative hypothesis. Right? It's an alternative hypothesis that to the idea that there's just coevolutionary selection. And this is plausible that there could be. And so I agree with you. It would be really interesting to try to distinguish the two um, empirically. But I I just think that, that it's so important to have, to allow such alternative hypotheses to appear on the scene. And even in the face of historical, you know, sort of this historical fixation of opinion about vertical transmission being absolutely essential, something like this that is so simple in its form, in its simplicity, it is clearly showing that with horizontal transmission, you can have selection. So, I found that really inspiring, and thank you for writing this. We look forward to more papers. <laughs> thank you so much for your interest. <laughs> so we're, you can stay if you want, but <laughs> we're technically done at 2.30. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna use one of your sentences, I think, in pretty much all of the rebuttals that I will write for the rest of my time. It's, I get a lot of criticism using enrichment like models to, uh, to look at processes that occur in nature because they're too simplistic. Yeah. And, and you write, I hope the reader will appreciate that simple models such as these are vulnerable, always vulnerable to attack for leaving out some cherished detail. <laughs> <laughs> and will grant me license to concentrate on, in my case, processes that seem most relevant. So Perfect. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank you. Good to see you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will stop the recording and we will figure out a way to get it to you. It's going to be rather large. Okay, that, and I could put it on YouTube then, perhaps. Oh, wow. Okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye bye. Bye.